relationship with the right referral partner could be a game changer for any B2B company. So what if you could reverse engineer these relationships at a moment's notice? Start a podcast, invite potential referral partners to be guests on your show, and grow your referral network faster than ever. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. My name is Ethan Butte. I host the Customer Experience Series here on the show. And today's conversation is a winner. We're going to be talking about why customers leave and how to win them back with David Averin, who speaks and writes on customer experience and marketing. We run through how customer expectations have been changing, how people's relationships with our brands have been changing, why we need to be more vigilant and always on. Why do empower employees to make their own decisions on our behalf and on behalf of our brands and our experiences that we're creating? Why quality is no longer enough to differentiate us, to win people over and bring people back? Why wow moments, those surprise and delight moments are not nearly as important as simple good outcomes for our customers? And why he recommends simple personal videos to help us connect and communicate more effectively with our customers. Without any further ado, here is David Averin on the B2B Growth Show. My guest today is a customer experience expert. He's a customer experience and marketing keynote speaker and consultant. He's the author of three books, It's Not Who You Know, It's Who Knows You, Visibility Marketing, and the new Why Customers Leave and How to Win Them Back. My favorite thing about this book so far and we'll get to David in a minute, is that Jay Baer of Convince and Convert and the author of Talk Triggers calls this book an eviscerating indictment of how poorly customers are often treated and the powerful recipe for doing the exact opposite. David Averin, welcome to the Customer Experience Podcast. It's great to be here, my friend. Yeah, I I love the eviscerating indictment. I'm sure we're going to get into some of those themes. But David, I want to start where I always start, which is your definition or your thoughts about customer experience. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are its characteristics? Sure. And that's a great question because... Because I think it's sort of a new discipline, though I think some of the the tenets of it are are fairly timeless. But so many people, I think, who used to be sort of customer service people have morphed into customer experience. I'm actually one of these people that morphed from marketing to customer experience. And sort of the genesis of it for me was the fact that I've been, been teaching marketing from the stage, writing books, consulting for 20 plus years. And what I found was that I'm working with these organizations. We do a great job of of positioning them or maybe repositioning them, of attracting customers and clients. And then they screw it up by pissing them off somehow, right? You know, they have a wonderful product, great services, great people, and then they put them on hold for 45 minutes or things that that will, will frustrate them. And then they no longer recognize their greatness because they're distracted by something else. So in my mind, customer experience is how do you, as a customer, and I think our greatest Role. Even for those of us in business, our most predominant role is that of a consumer, right? As we all are, uh, is how do we experience doing business with you at every point of contact, way beyond customer service? I think we get that. It's not unimportant, but I think it's pretty well known that the service with a smile and, and engage people and beat them to the greed and all of those things. I think we get that. Um, I think it requires ongoing reminders and training. But customer experience is very different. Is how do your customers literally, physically, virtually experience doing business with you at every point of contact? And what's interesting today is a failure at any of those points, or even falling short at any of those points, can be enough 
to drive people away and into the arms of, of competitors. And so what I do is I speak across the country and around the world. I have 24 countries in the last several years working with organizations, companies, associations, and others to help them pull out a magnifying glass and look more carefully from the customer's perspective, online, on their phone, face-to-face, during the transaction, after the transaction, and saying, how are people doing business with you? And more importantly, how do they want to do business with you? And how do they want to do business with you two years from now? And what are we doing to address all of that? That's awesome. Really broad coverage there of all the themes around customer experience. Sure. Uh, great response. And it's that every touch point piece. And you talked about the various yeah. and ways we connect with people. Talk to me now about the relationship between customer experience and visibility. Visibility is kind of a theme with you. Uh, sure. Visibilitycoach.com, Visibility International. What is this theme of visibility about for you? Well, you know, what's interesting today and probably more than ever in history is that everything that happens is, is shared. I ask audiences, I said, okay, who has teenagers at home, right? They overshare everything. I mean, there is nothing that they don't take pictures of and share. And as a parent, it's pretty scary sometimes. It's like, can you actually have a thought that you don't share with the world because the internet is forever? And so in terms of visibility, it's the good, it's the bad, and the ugly. Yelp, TripAdvisor, Rotten Tomatoes, Glassdoor, everything is shared. So organizations really have to pay attention. You can have a multi-billion dollar company and some moron 16-year-old on the front end who, who takes a hamburger bun and wipes it on the floor to get back at a customer and videotapes it and, and, you know, and puts it on link chat or snap face or, you know, and my kids are funny. They're like, oh my God, dad, you don't get it. I said, oh no, no, no. I teach it. Trust me, I do. So visibility, it can be in and it can be inadvertent. I tell audiences, I tell organizations I work with, I said, you have to do business with an expectation that every person you encounter is armed with a video camera because they are, and it's all on their phone. So it's a scary time to be in business. It's a scary time to be a parent, but the reality is your competitors are dealing with the same thing. Now, I don't know how this is all going to flesh out in the next several years. I mean, there has to be some way for the pendulum to swing back. But right now, everybody's on camera. Everything is being recorded. Everything is being shared. People feel um, not, it's not only their right, but it's their responsibility to go online and rant about any perceived slight or infraction right? 20 years ago, people in business, you know, not everybody's going to be happy. You do everything you can, you try and make it right. And at some point you just got to walk away, right? Somebody's just not going to be happy today. You can't walk away because they won't. And so, so in my book, why customers leave and how to win the back, I, I detail 24 reasons that, that people get frustrated at companies and in almost every case it's inadvertent on the part of the company. They're not intending to frustrate or annoy their customers. They're just trying to be efficient. They're trying to be predictable in terms of their behavior. But what happens in that is that there are scenarios that are outliers that maybe aren't part of their training. And how they respond to those is really important. That's the experience that the customer is having. When there's a special request, the easiest answer is always no. Sorry, we don't do that. What's the alternative? I mean, I'll give you a quick scenario. So uh, a young woman's at a restaurant with her friends and there's a chicken seed or salad. And she looks on the menu and there's shrimp on some other things. She says, can I, can I get shrimp instead of chicken? And he said, oh, sorry, we don't do substitution. Why? You know why they don't do substitutions? Because the cook doesn't want to. I don't care what the cook wants to do. I look at this as if I'm the owner of that business, give her what she wants. I mean, charge her a couple extra bucks. She's fine. What's the alternative? Not giving your customers what they ask for. And then they never come back and they go online and they rant about how much you suck. And so... I kind of detail those kinds of things that, that I think companies don't think about. The negative replies are typically more common than positive ones, but you Absolutely. just offer a scenario where you give the shrimp, you do it at equal price, and that could maybe not just as likely, but it could likely become a positive uh, sure. a positive post or, or share. So the picture you paint is really intimidating, I think, and you might have used that word already. You might have seen it, it in my mind. Should it should be, yeah. Because, because it's every touch point and we're always on. It's funny, I came from a broadcast television background. And so, you know, I always had this idea that 
these missed opportunities are always happening, right? Like if I don't have a new promo or the right promo airing in the right spot, like this, it just comes and goes. But now it's everything all the time. Everyone's always on. Let's get a little bit more into disappointment. I've always said one of my life philosophies is that disappointment is a function of expectations. And sure. People are disappointed when they uh, expected something more or better or even just different. And part of the premise of your book, obviously, and you've already alluded to it a little bit, is that consumers and their expectations have changed at a high Very level. Much. What's changed? What kind of timeline are we talking about here? Just talk a little bit about consumer expectations so that we can maybe manage them or meet them or exceed them differently. Absolutely. This is honestly the heart of everything I talk about. And the reason why this is more important than it has ever been, it's not just this urgency because business is hard and is competitive. It always has been. But there is a significant difference in the marketplace. And it's really occurred over the last 11 years or so since the advent of the iPhone. Because everything is so available at the touch of, a, of, of our thumb, at the swipe of our finger, that we've become accustomed to getting what we want when we want it. When we were kids and you didn't know how to spell a word, you'd say, mom, how do you spell ratatouille? What would mom say? Get the dictionary, right? We don't do that anymore. We don't have to go to the library to look something up. We expect everything now. So I saw an interesting statistic. It said only 15% of companies have adopted an always on business model to accommodate their always connected customers. The people who were up at two o'clock in the morning used to be the unemployed and the people sitting with a bag of Cheetos. But now it's, we're global. We're worldwide. In my office, we are incredibly responsive because I've got clients in Singapore, in Dubai, in Johannesburg, in Sydney. And so there's an expectation of immediate response. The other thing that, that's interesting is that, like I said, because everything is shared, it's different. And our mindset has to change because we grew up, listen, Ethan, you, we did stuff, right? <laughs> Growing up, there is no record of it right? You know, everybody should have the right to make poor choices as a teen, as a young person. We've all done it. I'm talking inappropriate more than illegal. But today, there's a permanence to infractions. And so today, the world is different. It's not just the expectations in terms of immediacy and accommodation and all of that, but also in terms of the permanence of infractions and the permanence of people's comments and reactions. And so it is a challenging time in business and, and things are different. And so, okay. You know, I, I hear people lament. I work with clients. They said, yeah, but this and this and this. And I look at them and I go, okay, that's the way it is. So what are you going to do about it? And so the good news is those who are very cognizant, that's why I think podcasts like this are very important to bring to light some of the new thinking around this and the challenges and help people recognize so that they can take action. Because I still hear, there's people with this old mindset, and Ethan, I still hear organizational leaders, CEOs and others get in front of their companies, and they'll still say things like, listen, folks, at the end of the day, it's still about quality. And I could not disagree more. At the beginning of the day, it's about quality. Quality is the entry fee. You better be good at what you do. That's not the, at the end of the day, it's about competitive advantage. At the end of the day, it's about recruitment and retention. It's about being better than others who are good at what you do. So I think there's a real connection to marketing. And I think we can market a superior customer experience. But I'll tell you, it's not. It's not wow moments. I mean, it's great if you have them. But it's not about somebody having a wow moment and you celebrate that for a year. It's about everybody getting what they want, how they want. It doesn't mean we can always accommodate everything. But we have to try. Yeah, that couple of really great things there in particular, the permanence of infractions. I don't know if that's a great album title from a cool band or if it's a great ebook that you should offer as a, as a uh, underline. Or at least a really good tweet. Hashtag David Averin. There you go. Yeah, yeah. The permanence of infractions is awesome. And this, this wow moments thing, before I get on to the to question I intended to ask you, talk sure. a little bit more about that. I think there's a little bit of tension, especially in the CS world, customer success, customer support world in particular, about this balance between, I think what you're advocating for is the single most important thing is the desired outcome. When a lot of times what gets the headline or gets the conversation or what we want to pat ourselves right. on the back for is the wow moment. Talk about the tension or, or, or any other aspect of desired outcome versus wow moment as, the, as a primary deliverable. 
Sure. But I, I think it goes back to what you said before, which is the um, managing expectations. Wow moments are great. I'm, I'm not against wow moments. Wow moments are great because they are shared probably more than others because they are extraordinary, right? It is it's something where somebody went way above and beyond. But you don't build businesses. You get some momentary fleeting press about it. It's great, but it's an old boss of mine used to say, when you do things like that, it's like, it's like peeing in your pain. It'll give you a really warm feeling for a moment, but it's not going to do you much good in the long run. And so what I talk about is making sure that, first of all, that we correct anything and everything that might cause people distress or frustration or things like that. But beyond that is galvanizing in policy. Here's who we are. This is how we do what we do at every point of contact. And so you know, I think we spend so much time training our staff and our people on policy quoting. And I think what we should really do is spend more time training them on decision making. And so instead of those situations where it's the easiest thing, the level of pr- predictability comes from just here's how we do it, right? If we don't let them make decisions, then they're not going to make a wrong decision, right? I mean, look at it from the perspective of, of hiring. So companies spend so much time recruiting and interviewing and evaluating prospects and going through the interview process and asking them questions to check their judgment. And as soon as we hire them, we neuter them, right? Now just do it this way. And the reality is, I think sometimes the greatest gift that companies have is their people, right? They have different experiences and judgment. And, and yeah, occasionally they may make a wrong decision, but give them, giving them the freedom to infuse a, a measure of humanity sometimes just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. You may not even make money on it. I'll work with people who will approach me sometimes about speaking about a subject I don't speak about. And what I do is I make sure they find the exact right person that will do a, a killer job. I don't speak on leadership. I don't speak on time management. I do customer experience and I do marketing, but I will help them find the right person because it's the right thing to do. You can call it karma. You can call it kismet or whatever else. So. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I but I think the um, I think that the pull in terms of of deliverables, I think that that comes about as a result of of having very pleased customers and clients. I think the wow moments are episodic, but a, a well designed, well executed, well reinforced customer experience program is persistent. It is predictable as opposed to something that is that is instantaneous or episodic. Both can be valuable, but one is sustainable. That's great. Love it. I also love the call to uh, to recruit and retain and train employees well, to empower them, to light them up on this is who we are and this is how we do what we do and then allow yeah. them the, the space to make appropriate decisions consistent with the values, consistent with the mission, consistent with how you do what you do, but with their own freedom to, to do the right thing. Right. Great- I, think, I think companies would be stunned if they really took a step back at how often they say no to their customers and prospects. And maybe not, it's not even the word no, maybe it's just, oh, sorry, we can't allow that. Or sorry, you, you bring that Coke in the store. Really? Is, is, is that for 55 year old? I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get chocolate on your clothes, but you're treating, you know, we're leaving stores and they're checking our receipt. Did you really think I just stole something? Right, are you talking really? about like, every time I leave Costco, I wonder like, are you just making sure I don't have an 80 inch TV in my cart that's not on right. the receipt? It's like, it's like trust them until they, until they become untrustworthy. They have a whole chapter about that. Stop, stop treating your customers like, like criminals. But, but we also say, no, there's, there's some really interesting ways that, that, I mean, there's one policy, and I talk about this because this one makes me crazy, that most people don't think about because I think it's actually the cruelest policy. How many times do you see in the window of a store restrooms for customers only? Overseas, they'll call them toilets, right? Toilets just for, for customers only. Really? Somebody needs to use the restroom. I mean, my God, be a human being. Well, we're not here. I don't want to take people to take advantage. They're not taking advantage. Of you. They, have, they have to go to the bathroom. You know, I, I talk to audiences, and, you know, and I, there's a lot of humor and, and it's very entertaining when I speak, but I use it strategically to temper a pretty tough message about what it takes to compete today. And I'll ask them, I say, how many of you, show, by show of hands, how many of you have ever bought something you would never, you would ne- have never bought before just so you could use the bathroom? right? A chapstick, a pack of gum, right? A cup of coffee. Well, guess what, Sparky? You just made a buck 35 and I'll never come back again. You're a jerk. 
you know? I mean, it's just at, at some point we're, we're so worried that people are going to take advantage of us and do the wrong thing that we punish everyone for what will ostensibly be the actions of 1%. Or two percent, and I and I get that companies have to protect themselves against loss and everything else. But I walk into some stores. I was in a uh, a, a big box something in, in a city, and I won't I won't name them specifically. But they seemed far more concerned about what somebody might steal than what they might sell. I mean, I tried to go in the in the dressing room. Sorry, you can't take more than three items. Really? But I want to try on more than three items. Oh, and you can't bring shoes at all. I'm like, my God, do you really think I'm going to steal something? You know, and it's everything. And, and, and I'll tell you, the way certain minorities are treated is so tragic and so cruel. This, this, this suspicion, which treat people like human beings, do reasonable things to, you know, for loss prevention, but treat people like human beings. And once again, I go through so many of these things in the books and in, in everything else, but I really see myself, and maybe it's self-appointed crusader on this, but I think companies, businesses can do so much better of making us feel respected that certainly will foster loyalty. Uh, yeah. The call to treat people like people, I think is, um, I feel like it's, it's been emerging well in general business culture over the past several years. Yeah. There's companies that get it. Yeah, I think it's really important, and I and I love that that's a theme. You've already you've already hit on that two or three times just in this conversation already. To go on that just a little bit, this is a little bit selfish, but you've seen sure. dozens and dozens of videos with Bomb Bomb, and you know, our our premise here is that you're better in person, and that if you're just a little bit more personal and human in some of the touches that you're making, you'll be more successful. Just give absolutely, me, just give me a, a minute or two on why you like video for communication and how it maybe humanizes you with, or how has people feel like they know you before they ever meet you? Yeah. And listen, and this is not, this is not an endorsement. This is not, I mean, this is not a paid endorsement. It's not a commercial. I am a bomb bomb evangelist and, and granted it can be almost any video. I like bomb bomb because of the analytics, like it can track who opens it, but we have, we kill it with bomb bomb because for us, it is that little bit that pushes it over, over the hump. They already, we're already talking to engaging with the prospective client. They're considering me to keynote their conference. But I also know that whoever else is a finalist is likely very, very good at what they do. I have wonderful colleagues and, and connections who are very good at this. So I know it's just a preference at that point. So we can never allow everything to be equal. And so for us, Bomb Bomb is our competitive advantage. Because if I have an opportunity face-to-face -face with the client, that they've seen a proposal, they've, they've talked to my assistant, we've talked numbers. Well, now they get to hear from me. Here's what I know about your industry. Here's what I'll deliver. And when we create that, um, it's a very simple bomb bomb, right? It's a three, two, one. Hi, Jennifer, Dave and Averin, customer experience, Mark, and keynote speaker. I know you've been talking to Tiffany here in my office about the possibility of me coming and presenting for your conference coming up in Vegas in November. I tell you, I think the fit is great. And then go on and talk about their industry. They hear me talking about the deliverables. Here's what I'll do. And I, then I look at the camera and I say, I will make you a hero for bringing me in. I promise. Keep working with Tiffany. Anybody wants to have a conversation, right? Because what you can't do in email is you can't have inflection. You can't have enthusiasm. I mean, the best you can do is, is put things in all caps or bold, but then it looks like you're shouting. Get them. So for us, it's very personal. It's very face to face. They can see the smile on my face. They can see the enthusiasm and can talk about them. The people who are, as we've talked to others and promoted this and encouraged them to do it, sometimes they're very nervous. And I say, listen, first of all, if you don't like it, delete it and start over again. I do it. I do it all the time. But I say, how often are you nervous when the phone rings? And they go, what do you mean? I say, when the phone rings, when you you have no idea who's there or what you're going to say, but you're not nervous. You just have a conversation. I say, think of that the same way when you do a bomb bomb, a video email, that communication, just talk to them. Don't give them a speech. Don't write a script because it's, it, there, it is inauthentic. So there's my endorsement for bomb bomb because we use it. And, and I will tell you our conversion rate, when we get to the point where my assistant says, I need you to do a bomb bomb, have a quick conversation with them. We're upwards of 80% conversion rate just when we use bomb bomb. And it's not about the vehicle. It's about using that vehicle well, and to be very, very conversational. So for it's part of our experience. They love working with Tiffany. She's brilliant. She's a dream, very efficient. But then they get experience working with me. And so this for us is a little bit of sampling, right? This is like Costco and Sam's Club on a Saturday. 
you can feed a family of 12 at Costco on a Saturday, right? It's giving them a chance to to try before they buy. What it's like to do business with you before they do business with you. And so for BombBomb for us is they get a chance to see what it's like to work with me, to understand my perspective, my approach, my, my deliverables before they make a decision. And so for us, it has been remarkably successful. Awesome. I Again, I wasn't just fishing for all no, that. No, I know you were, but I'm happy to do so. I think it's important for people to understand is we're talking about treating people as humans and human connection. And you hit a few really, really important key ideas, not using a script. This is about being who you are. It's yep. about being authentic. It's about differentiating yourself. And you are your own best differentiator. Not only if you're David Averin and what you're selling is David, a- David Averin and the David Averin experience on the stage at your next event, Every single one of us is our own best differentiator. And the seat that we're in was earned because of who we are. And our next opportunity is going to be one because of who we are, whether you're directly in sales or not directly in sales. I'll I'll just... Let me throw throw one last thing before you move on, because I want to piggyback on that. The worst thing that can happen for anybody, and we're all in sales, we're all trying to, you know, for us, I even say in, in speaking, speaking is not a business. Getting the gig is the business right? Speaking is, is, is the performance, this is the deliverable. The risk is for anybody in sales is having somebody else present your materials to the decision maker. More sales is lost, are lost in that gap because nobody sells yourself better than you do. Nobody knows what you do. So if you present to somebody and then find out they're not the decision maker and then they go, oh yeah, I talked to David Averin. He seemed really smart and enthusiastic. He talks about this and this. They just lost 95% of what I do. So the real value for us of the bomb bomb of the video communication is that we're making our pitch for us and nobody, as you said, does it better than we can do it ourselves. Yep. And you get past the gatekeeper and then the tracking and analytics, close the loop. So you know, you got there. So when you see your email got open 14 times, and then video got played eight times, you know, you made it through just fine. Um, exactly. and, but before I go to, to a couple of ways, I really love to wrap these conversations You've run CEO roundtable groups. You've done it, yep. you did it for several years. When you, of course, you consult companies all over the world. Talk about that level of the organization. You know, at the, at the very beginning of the conversation, you referred to customer experience as a new discipline based on timeless tenets. In terms of the new discipline part of it, where is customer experience in the C-suite these days? Like how seriously is it being taken? Is it being actively developed, managed, structured? Like what, what are the conversations happening in the C-suite around customer experience, specifically this, this new discipline version of it, not just the timeless tenets of it? Sure. I think more and more. I think they're really, really getting it. First of all, for those who are voracious learners within the C-suite, they cannot help but hear again and again and again about, about customer experience. Sometimes I think it is, is so overly analytical that sometimes they're so 100,000 feet that it's almost too much, but they're recognizing it. I think some of them are just being pulled along and recognizing the, the significant differences between customer experience and customer service, both important, but I think it's absolutely being recognized more and more. How they do it and, and actually putting uh, personnel in, in place and in charge of the effort and coordinating with their marketing efforts, coordinating with their sales efforts and making sure that it's an integrated program is, it's young, but there are major organizations who really, really get this, who are acting as a model for others. You know, I, I think one of the things that's interesting, even from a, a consumer perspective, historically, we have always businesses have always been sort of compared against others in their space. And, and as a business owner, you kind of had to be better than, than the middle point of other competitors or hopefully on the higher end. Consumers today are comparing companies to everybody, right? Well, Uber can tell me what my driver looks like and where they are and when they're going to show up. Why can't you do that? Cable right? company. Right, right. Or Amazon can deliver in 30 minutes in some city, whatever. Why can't you? So that alone and the potential loss and, and the disruption, which of course is profound, is making everybody take notice. And especially when there's sort of a measure of parity in terms of quality and commitment and caring and trust and all the stuff that everybody talks about, everybody's good today. I mean, you if you wouldn't, if you aren't, you'd be outed pretty quickly because the internet outs underperformers. So what they're realizing is their their real opportunity for differentiation is the experience. 
And so I work hard to make sure that they understand the experience isn't about sporadic wow moments, but it's about a consistently predictable, great, better than most experience, transaction, et cetera. Awesome. As you may know, as someone who's uh, been connected with our our team and our company as a customer for some time, core value number one for us is relationships. And so Mm -hmm. I always like to give you, as we come to a close, I always like to give you the opportunity to thank or mention someone who's had a positive impact on your life or your career and a company that's doing customer experience really, really well today. Sure. You know what? Boy, there, there's so many people. I, I love that old, and, and I think it's probably a poster, a motivational poster on the wall of a lot of organizations as well. And something that says, when I see a, a turtle on a fence post, I know that he didn't get there by himself, right? And so for all of us who've had a measure of success, for me, it's, it's, it's clients, but it's also, it's also mentors and mentors who became friends and colleagues. And then it almost like the role switch because you become colleagues when you're young in the business, you're in your 20s, but when you're mature in your 50s, and I'm 55 now, we're all kind of peers at that point. But but there was a one of my best friends, a, a guy named Eric Chester, who speaks on sort of the emerging workforce. He wrote so many great books. There's a, a great book called On Fire at Work. And uh, But Eric Chester for me has been uh, my friend, my mentor. There's times that, that I've helped him and he's... And the people that are sort of with you for decades. And he's one of those guys. So, hey, I appreciate the opportunity to give a shout out. And in terms of companies that do this well, I, I'm trying to think of just... I mean, there's... There's the classic ones that come to mind, the Zappos and whoever else, the Southwest Airlines and whatever. But I think there, there's a couple of things that, that I think typify them. And, and you can almost find two or three companies in almost any category. One is that they are remarkable in the sense that they're worthy of being remarked about. Right? There's something they're doing that's so interesting or different or better or faster or more facilitated or more personal or humorous that it actually makes you want to talk about them to someone else. And so for like Southwest Airlines, one of those, just because they have the funny, you know, messages or whatever, you know, am I going to go on Southwest Airlines just because I know that, that there's a good chance that the, the flight attendant is going to do a funny safety announcement? No, but you remember them more. You're, you're less likely to bitch about them because, you know, travel is so difficult and everything else. But then there are the other ones who just make it astonishingly easy to do business with them. And for me, the superstars in customer experience are the ones who make it astonishingly easy to do business. The ones, I mean, there's great companies that you literally cannot talk to a real person if you want to. You go to their website and and you can search for 20 minutes and you will not find a phone number or an email address. And they intentionally decided as an organization, we will not let our customers talk to us. Like literally, I want to slash my wrists under the table. And then they expect us to have loyalty and to want to do business with them. But they're designing their business to purposely be difficult to do business with. And it boggles my mind. So to answer your question in terms of who does this right, anybody who is astonishingly easy to do business with and anybody who gives you something to talk about. We love, we say, if you want people to talk about you, give them something to talk about. Love it. And you also ran through, if anyone wants to hit that 30 second back button or 15 second or 60 second back button, you ran through a few characteristics too. It doesn't always have to be one thing, right? You said, you know, humor is one way to do it, but there are several ways, several ways to do that. The thing I love about Southwest personally is the transparency concept. Yeah. Again, it's not a surprise and delight. It's not a wow. It's just this I'm not going to nickel and dime you. Even United, who I'm very loyal to and have the credit card and fly often, they're starting to charge nine bucks for like the seats in the middle of economy instead of putting you in the back. It's like, so, so this idea that just buy your ticket, the cost is the cost. You can bring your bags on. We'll get you on the plane quickly. It's like, that's this, that's this desired outcome delivered really easily. Hey, David, right. this has been an absolute pleasure. I assume folks can go on to, uh, to Amazon or anywhere else, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, to, to pick up why customers leave and how to win them back. What are some other ways people can connect with you? Sure. My website is visibilityinternational.com. I'm actually remarkably easy to get a hold of. I always tell people, unless I'm on a plane or on stage, I'm available. I've got staff, but I am. Uh, I work, once again, because I'm in a competitive marketplace, to be astonishingly easy to do business with. So if anybody wants to reach out, I respond personally as well. I don't always have the, the time to schedule. My assistant schedules that. But my books are all online. They're all on audiobook in my voice. They're all on Kindle. And uh, I'm an evangelist. So anybody who's, who's looking for, uh, for connection, I'm happy to do so. And I appreciate the opportunity to extol the virtues of 
bomb bomb, but also uh, to uh, engage in my crusade to, to help people and organizations treat people better and respectfully and more humanely. I have a, uh, I'll leave you with this, my, my life mission, my mantra is on the wall. I'm staring at it right now and I type it up and I just, it says, I want to spend my life doing things that matter with people who care. And that's how I approach everything. It's a perfect conclusion. When you operate from that mindset, it's going to be really difficult to do customer experience poorly. David Averin, and, and for anyone that, that wants to go check him out, is just David and then A-V-R-I-N, David Averin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Love your philosophy. With Love you as well, my friend. And uh, continued success to you. And if I can ever be of value, let me know. All right. Thank you, buddy. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. He's got some great stories to share there. So feel free to follow up with David. And if you want to hear more episodes of the Customer Experience Podcast, just search it in Apple iTunes or in Apple Podcasts. You can find it in Spotify. And if you want to check out every episode and see overviews, even see video clips with all of the guests, you can visit bombbomb.com slash podcast. That's B-O-M-B, B-O-M-B dot com slash podcast. Again, my name is Ethan Butte, and thank you for listening to the B2B Growth Show. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. 